Our next teller is a computer analyst by day and a father, husband, fisherman, and podcast producer by night. This is his first experience live storytelling. Be kind. <laughs> As a young man, I decided I would only say I love you to one woman. And I came up with milestones for a serious relationship. They were move in together, say I love you, get married, and buy a house. But in February of 1996, I wasn't thinking about any of that. I was on my way to Shootsbury, Massachusetts to spend the weekend with my girlfriend. She was house sitting there. I left Franklin, I was working there. And it started snowing in the afternoon. Not too bad. As I headed west further on 90, I ended up having to drive in the tracks of the tractor trailer trucks in front of me. The roads hadn't been plowed yet. When I got off onto the side roads, it was now dark. It was a full blown snowstorm. And I had to stop at every intersection where I thought I might need to turn, get out of the car, go up to the street sign to read the name of the street. <laughs> I did that for 40 minutes. <laughs> I finally got to the road where the house is supposed to be. And at this point, the car is actually snow plowing through the snow. Karen told me to look for a big blue barrel at the end of the driveway because there's no mailboxes to identify the houses. So I'm driving along, and in the snow, I see a big hump on the side of the road. Get out of the car, go over, wipe it off, it's a big, blue, a big blue barrel. So I look out into the dark and through the snow, I just see this faint, faint light. But I decide, this has to be where the house is. So I get back in my car, steer toward the driveway, drive forward, when all of a sudden, the car just drops down a hill, the snow comes up over the windshield, and I have no control. As the car levels out, the windshield clears, and I can just see with the lights now, there's no trees in front of me, so I get a gas, because I don't want to get stuck in the middle of the woods. And the light is getting closer, so I just move straight forward, and I can start to make out the outline of a house. So I end up pulling up in front of a garage, and Karen comes out with a big smile on her face. I get out of the car with my heart in my throat, and I yell to her, I must be stupid crazy about you. <laughs> I am. <laughs> so I add to my list of milestones doing something stupid crazy, like driving into the woods in the middle of the night during a snowstorm, and check it off. I think I deserve that one. <laughs> that spring, I asked Karen if she'll move in with me. And she agrees. However, her parents would like to talk to us about this. <laughs> so they take us out to Vinny Testis for the conversation. We have appetizers and we chit chat, and Karen goes off to the restaurant. As she gets out of earshot, her mother leans forward and says, so what's this about you two moving in together? And as I'm about to defend myself, her father extends his hand out and says, Ben, we couldn't be happier. <laughs> so they're on board for the most part. And it helps that we rent an apartment that's a short walk through the woods to their house. <coughs> that summer, we decided to vacation with them in New Hampshire. While we're there, we stop at an antique farm to browse. I'm checking out the overpriced Star Wars toys when Karen comes up to me and says she'd like to show me something. She takes me over to where her mother is standing in front of a jewelry case. And Karen says, pointing to a diamond ring, if I were to ever be proposed to, this is the way I would Okay, I say. That's good to know. I haven't even told her I love her yet. Later that week, we're packing up to go home. Karen says, you know, I really want some of those sugar snap peas from that farm stand that we've been getting all week. I said, you, you keep packing, I'll go get the sugar snap peas. And off I go past the farm stand to the antique farm to buy the ring, but I'm not even sure why yet. 
one of the issues is that the ring doesn't cost the traditional three month salary. Mm. It costs far less. And Karen's mother knows the price. <laughs> <laughs> but I go and I buy the ring, and I say to the cashier, if a woman and her daughter come in, please tell them that a really old man bought this ring. I don't want them to know about it. So I have the ring. I book it to the farm stand, get some sugar snap peas, and book it back to the apartment. They're just finishing packing, and Karen and her mom are none the wiser. October arrives, and I've decided that Karen is the woman that I love and I want to marry her. But I can't propose yet. Her brother's getting married this month, and I don't want to steal the limelight from him and his wife. So I decide I choose a weekend in December that I'll do the proposal. That weekend arrives, and that Saturday morning, I say to Karen, Karen, let's go for a walk. You see, back in the spring, Karen and I were walking in the woods, and Karen said to me, not that this has to happen now, but if I was ever beat to propose to you, I'd suddenly like this. I took the hint. So, unfortunately, Karen's busy this morning, so we have to go for a walk in the afternoon. It's okay. Afternoon arrives, and it's raining. So, I cajole Karen, and I convince her to go for the walk. And it's, it's beautiful in its own right with the rain glistening off the icicles on the trees. <laughs> About 10 minutes into the walk, I decide that I better do this now before she wants to turn back. So I have her lead the way. I pull the ring out of my pocket, and I say, look what I found. When I bring the ring up, and I show it to her, she looks and says, that kind of looks like the ring we saw in New Hampshire. <laughs> do you think so? <laughs> A few seconds later, she realizes it is the ring. She looks up at me with tears in her eyes, or is it just rain? <laughs> I take her hands and I say to her, I only want to ever say I love you to one person. I'm saying it now. I love you. Will you marry me? She says yes. And right away I say, your mother knows the price of this ring, so if you want to get a different one, we can. <laughs> She says, no, it's the only ring I've ever wanted. Just like to this day, Karen's the only woman I ever wanted. Thank you. Aww. Last month's annual Big Mouth Off competition, and she's told for WGBH's stories from the stage. And she's told many stories as a feature teller here for Feature Productions. She is an expert in child development whose podcast, We Turned Out Okay, features lots of stories and updates weekly. Please welcome Karen Locke Cole. So do you remember Ben of I Must Be Stupid Crazy About You? Well, I'm Karen. <laughs> so it is the summer of 1996, and I'm on vacation in New Hampshire with my boyfriend Ben and my parents and my brother and sister-in-law, and I'm standing in an antique shop, and I've got this ring <laughs> on my finger. And it's sparkling there beautifully, and I've got tears in my eyes because I know that this ring will never be mine. When Ben took a look at this ring on my finger, he turned a real green around the gills, and he kind of stumbled off outside to a bench, and he's been there ever since. <laughs> and a few days later, when we are getting ready to leave, uh, my, my boyfriend offers to go and get some sugar snap peas. And he goes off and he comes back in what seems like a flash. And my mother and I both happen to be standing near a window when he returns. And my mother takes my hand and she says, he didn't have time, did he? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm crying and I say, I agree with her. I say, no, he didn't have time. So you can imagine my surprise when, several months later, uh, Ben says to me, come on, let's go for a walk in the woods. And I'm like, but it's raining. <laughs> and he's like, no, come on, it'll be fun, really. I'm like, but, but the rain is gonna get these, like, stuck in my hair, I don't know about this. And he says, come on, please, come on. So I say, okay, we go out in the woods. And then you can imagine my surprise again when he leans down and he says, look what I found. 
And it's the ring. It's the ring. And then he says to me, I love you. Will you marry me? And now I am crying. And, uh, and of course I say yes, and, and I'm so thrilled. So all of that, that's what Ben did for love. But I like to think that all of that was possible because of what I did for love. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I'm going to take you back one year previous. It is June of 1995. And I am driving down the road from UMass, where I go to graduate school, to a party in Connecticut. And I am feeling free and happy. I'm, I'm loving what I'm doing in life. I'm learning to be a teacher. And I just feel like it's so right for me. And I am free of boyfriends, which means I'm free of boyfriend drama, which is wonderful. And I'm, I'm headed to a graduation party for a dear friend of mine who's just graduated from college. His name is Chris, and his girlfriend, Beth, is one of my buddies from college. So I'm so excited because there's going to be a whole bunch of college people, and it's going to be a whole weekend. It's on a lake. We're all bringing tents, and we're going to stay in, you know, on this lake in our tents. It's going to be awesome. And when I get there, sure enough, Chris and Beth are there, and a lot of college buddies are there. My roommate, Jen, my old roommate, is there. And there are some new people, too, and one of them is this really cute guy named Ben. And when Beth introduces me to Ben, and we shake hands, I feel the earth move. I'm not kidding. I think to myself, wow, this is somebody really, really special. This is somebody that I need to know better. And that night, we're all setting up our tents. Mine is a modern 1990s little two-pole wonder, so you flick the poles and it, it becomes, you make a little X and it, it just goes up immediately. Ben's tent is not that. He's got an ancient tent that is asymmetrical, didn't come with directions. Um, there's about 30 poles. I mean, it takes him hours to set this tent up. And we're not allowed to sleep in the house. The, the deal is that the graduate and the friends are out in the backyard. Nobody's allowed in the house. And so he's got to get this tent up, right? And um, as he's doing that, and we're all hanging out together, um, jello shots are being consumed, there's a lot of <laughs> singing, it's, it's really, really good fun. And Ben is, he's so tenacious, he's just getting this tent up, but he's also very sociable and fun. And my friend Jen says to me, hey, that Ben guy's cute, huh? And I say, listen, you keep your hands off, he's mine. <laughs> And I think I'm smi I know I'm smiling, but I think that she, she gets that I'm serious. And as the night goes on, Ben and I really kind of gravitate towards each other. And it seems that other people get the sense that we might be interested in each other as well. I don't remember how this happens, but somehow Beth and Chris don't have a tent. So Beth ends up sleeping in my tent, and Chris ends up sleeping in Ben's tent. And in the middle of the night, Chris comes over to my tent in full hearing of everybody. And he says, Karen, Karen, come on. I want to sleep with Beth, so you have to sleep in Ben's tent. Come on, you know you want to. You know you want to. Let's switch, let's switch. And I'm like, shut up. I feel like I'm back in high school. I don't want him to know that I like him. Shut up. You know? Get it. So we do not switch. We do not switch. Beth's. Ben stays, Beth stays in my tent, and Ben stays in his tent with Chris. And the next day, I realize I've got a little bit of a problem, because I'm like a good girl. And Ben is a little shy, and I don't want to overwhelm him, but I really do want to be able to communicate that I like him, right? And it, even though it's the 90s, you can't just go up to somebody and say, hey, I like you. Do you like me? You, you just can't, you know, you can't do that without frightening him away. And all day, all day of the second day, I'm, I'm thinking to myself, just make your move, just make your move. And I'm like, but what is my move? I don't, I don't have a move. I don't know what my move should be. And as it gets to be nighttime, it starts raining. So we, we sort of gravitate into this tiny pool shed, it's, you know, by a lake. So there's, there's, a, like, there's a little keg fridge and there's, you know, we're all just hanging out in this pool shed. And um, this is where I realize I do have one move I can make. So Ben and I are both leaning against the keg fridge. And slowly, like microscopically, over maybe an hour, I lean. <laughs> it takes a really, really long time for me to sort of get into position where I'm leaning right here. And after I've been there long enough, giving the sort of nonverbal encouragement, I feel Ben's arm go up and I feel it come around me. And I think, ah, oh, that feels so good. And it, it, tr it truly does. It feels 
it's so good to know that he likes me too and, and that this is working, this is good. And the rain has another ha kind of happy consequence too. It gives me an excuse to say, hey, that tent is pretty leaky. <laughs> it's very old and leaky, so why don't you come and sleep in my tent? And that second night, that's exactly what Ben does. And we are up talking way too late. So late, in fact, that Jen, from her tent, somewhere else in the tent city that we've made, says, Karen, we've all heard these stories. <laughs> go to sleep. <laughs> so we do go to sleep. And when we wake up in the morning, we are holding hands, Ben and I, and he says to me, thank goodness for ancient leaky tents. Aww. And the rest is history. <laughs> And it sounds like a really small thing, and maybe it is a really small thing, but I like to think that this ring that I wear and the beautiful Rainy Woods proposal and the two children and the 20 years and counting of happy marriage all came about because of the move that I made <laughs> in the shed by the lake for the graduation party. I like to think that that is what I did for love. Thank you. Okay, we have run out of cults. <laughs>